this presentation, um, Michael's covered a lot of the stuff that um, uh, obviously around the TS, but what we wanted to do is just, we know Michael doesn't speak without notes, um, so we just wanted to, uh, with some structure in terms of the slides, go through some of the key points just to reaffirm them, and then talk around how you can think about making atypical employment and flexi staffing still work for you. Um, and that's not so much from a, you know, what's in it for status, it's more as employers, we can't employ every single person that we ever need to do some work for us. Um, and uh, using another company is not always an option either. So we need to try and find flexible uh, working uh, in order to stay nimble. Um, so in terms of navigating the new labor landscape, um, this is something that Michael and his colleagues tell us almost every time we meet them when we talk about this law and we say, but could we do this? Could we do that? How about this? They're, it's always better to react to the law as it is rather than be the test case that helps define its interpretation. Um, there are a number of cases going to court already and going to CCMA that are helping define it, but it's obviously not a great place for those companies to be in. Um, someone has to do it, but our intent is to we're not the ones and our clients aren't the ones because you just don't know what will happen. Um, so what does the new IR landscape look like? Well, first of all, the law um, actually came into effect on the 1st of April, but it's retroactive to the 1st of January. So if you have a claim against you, it will be from the 1st of January. Um, so bear that in mind. Um, the main clauses that uh, in the new amendments that particularly affect atypical employment are section 198, A, B, C, and D. And I'm sure all of you, when you go away, that's the first thing you're going to go is go and read the law and those clauses. Um, but we've sort of summarized them, um, and hopefully this helps clarify them. Um, so in terms of what it applies to, it applies to fixed-term contracts, it applies to part-time consultants, and it also applies to temporary uh, uh, staff. Um, the main uh, elements of this are the three-month limit. So basically, you can employ someone on a fixed-term contract or temporary or part-time and them not be permanently employed for the first three months. Once you hit the three-month mark, they're considered permanently employed unless you can prove that they weren't. And this is where Michael's talking about you must have a contract and your contract must explicitly state this so that you can prove it because the onus is on you to prove it. Also, you must be able to prove that the employee understood the nature of the work when they started it. So if you have a contract but they never saw it or it's worded in a way where it's misleading, like Michael said, where it's talking about next July and you're, you know, it's eight months away, it, you're going to probably uh, be found against. Um, and in terms of that three-month limit, um, there's no real case law around it. So we don't know exactly what the gray areas are now. And obviously, no one here wants to be that test case. Um, but at this stage, it looks like there isn't a workaround in terms of the three-month and um, becoming permanent. There are ways, obviously, to still uh, contract out to temporary staffing, and, and the temporary staffing company will need to take the risk around um, them being permanent and carrying that risk. But that's obviously something they can work out with you. But the three months looks hard and fast. As the case law happens, obviously we'll know more and we can keep you updated, but it's gonna take about a year to play out. Um, equal treatment is a big one because especially how it affects pay and benefits. And once you start thinking about the implications of that, it's actually quite far reaching in your organization, not just in terms of pay, but how it affects how you structure uh, your operations, your incentives, your rewards, uh, benefits. It also applies to training. So, for example, uh, obviously none of you guys, because you're all best practice, but uh, some companies, a lot of companies, don't give the same level of training to part-timers, because why would you? They're not there as long, they go, they leave quicker, why would you invest? Now, though, <coughs> equal treatment applies to giving them equal training and equal access to skills development, so that you're seen to be setting them up to succeed. Um, and then also applying for opportunities. Um, a number of companies may favor a permanent employee for whatever reason, over a part-time or a um, temporary or a fixed-term contract employee. As far as the law is now concerned, the everyone, no matter what their contractual status, needs to have the same access to be able to apply. Therefore, the communications need to go out to them. And also, when you assess them and when you make the appointment, you cannot do it with any sense uh, of their contractual status in terms of being temporary or part-time affecting why you make that decision.
So everyone has to be treated as equal. Obviously, the case law may show some gray areas, but at the moment, that's what the law is saying. And then termination, the same. Um, obviously, if it's a fixed-term contract, then that contract comes to an end, and it's all legit in terms of it is work that isn't ongoing and all that stuff, then that's fine. But you need to, um, you can't treat them differently in terms of termination. And then the onus of proof is on the employer, as Michael said, and that's really, really important because if you pitch up CCMA and sort of expect them to have make their case, that's not, the commissioner is going to look at your case and why you're in the right or the wrong. And if you haven't got a process or you haven't followed your process, it doesn't matter if they were stealing out the till, you're still going to be found against. Um, and then making sure that the employee understands the nature of the employment contract is very important and proving that. And proving it is a signature often on a document, but it's important to get that. So what are the claims an employee can make? In terms of fixed term and temporary employees and part-time employees, there's two types of claims that ultimately, if they go CCMA, it's going to be around unfair dismissal. It's going to be a claim for permanent employment, where there permanent employment where there is reasonable expectation for it, or a claim uh, based on reasonable expectation for a renewal of the contract. So, for example, in the law, you are allowed to extend a fixed-term contract, if um, rather make it permanent, if there are certain requirements which will come onto. But if you don't do it, but the work's ongoing, and they had an expectation that they would be renewed, <coughs> you can end up uh, in court for that or CCMA. And then the level of compensation for a successful claim based on equal treatment will be no less favorable than if they were permanent and the amount that a permanent employee would get in such a claim. So there are exemptions in the law. And again, the case law is still to happen around what this means, what the permutations are, how we can be creative, uh, et cetera, around this. But this is what they say at the moment the exemptions are. So for the three months, being able to employ someone on atypical employment longer than three months, the reasons are, um, the main one, which, uh, Dion, I know you're perhaps using it as a hypothetical, but the 20,000, they would be above the threshold. So they, these, all these uh, 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 amendments don't apply to them. A business doesn't have to treat anyone above that amount equally. Um, so the threshold earnings is a very important one. So, you know, if you don't want to bother with this law, just pay all your entry-level staff that much, and you're in the clear. Um, so if that's not a solution for you, um, then uh, seasonal employment that exceeds three months, but is clearly seasonal. So for example, um, I know there's a big retailer, uh, Amazon in the room today. No, the training manager was going to be coming, but they have a four or five month uh, seasonal window based on, and, and that's, I mean, uh, Ricardo used to be an ops manager at Amazon. And so there's a, a real seasonal period. It's for a fixed amount of time and they can show that and prove it. Um, a specified project, so, um, and that links to really where the work is uh, of a limited and definite duration. So Michael uses the example of if you're building a wall or constructing a house, it may take a year, it may take two years, but there is a definite, obvious end point, and at that point, you can end their contract because it is a very definite period and a very definite project. All work with uh, limited funding. Another example of that would be learnerships. Uh, where they're funded publicly. You've got specific funding, it's limited, it stops after 12 months, and the program is 12 months. And then also, um, and this is one where uh, we spoke to Michael's colleague, and he was, they're, worried, they're a bit worried about how this may play out. Um, when someone is temporarily absent, um, that it sees three months of maternity leave. But, um, and Michael, perhaps you want to just chip in here. In terms of where uh, someone's on maternity leave, and then the, they come back, Brandon was a bit worried that perhaps there would be an expectation that you offer them another role as opposed to just the CCMA. What, what's your feeling on that one? Um, there might be an expectation of saying, well, can you place me elsewhere? And that's why that contract of employment, when you put Michael on, who's, you know, what's happened is Dermot's gone off on maternity leave. He now comes back. I'm now sitting over there saying, well, I, I've got nowhere else to go and I'd like to stay here. I'm very happy with you guys. Can you put me elsewhere? Because I have that expectation. If the contract specifically outlines, as I said to you, why you hear that you hear for a specific purpose and it outlines that to me, then I can't have that expectation that I would look around. 
if it just says you're employed for six months and then you mentioned to me in the passage on the way out, it's because Dermot's gone on maternity leave, then I might have that expectation. So you can see there could be those arguments. We're going to have those arguments. People are going to find, people are desperate. There's unemployment in South Africa today between the ages of 17 and 25 is 50 percent. So when someone comes in the doors, this is their chance. And people will challenge it. It's unfortunate, but that's the nature of things. You can't blame the people for challenging it. People want jobs. So I, I think Dermot understands that, but we need to make sure that the contracts are properly done. And if you've got any problems with contracts of employment, go back to Dermot. He can then outline it for you. Thank you. Uh, e exemptions for equal treatment. So again, the threshold earnings. Um, so again, just pay everyone a lot more. Um, and you're solved, but if that doesn't work for you, then um, the, you can differentiate on experience in the workplace, length of service, seniority of the appointment, merit of performance. Now, again, exactly how those things play out in the case law is still to be determined, but um, I think the, what the opportunity is, is obviously for companies to really think about how they pay for performance and really working out how they align uh, KPIs and pay <coughs> so that for example um, if it's on merit of performance and experience um, in the workplace those two are linked there's obviously an opportunity the important thing whatever you do though is it requires a fair clear and consistent categorization and an application of the process now given how in uh, operations and HR we're always sort of on that hamster wheel of busy busy or something to actually sit down and think about this at a strategic level and think two years hence, three years hence, you know, not just tweak it on the fly. Because once we put this in place, um, there are probably tricks and processes around changing it, but it's not as easy as changing it before this law. And if you keep changing it on the fly and it becomes a bit of a mess, you will lose at CCMA because one employee is going to know that you've gone and just changed it on the fly. So I think that this one in particular has a lot more implications and a lot more impact than perhaps it seems on the surface. Um, and also I think the importance for HR and operations to work very closely. Obviously operations need to guide on the long and short term KPIs. HR needs to guide operations on what the implications around compliance are for this. Uh, and I think it's gonna be a very tricky one and people are going to end up in CCMA on this, that, that's for sure. Call centers where we're always adjusting and tweaking via campaigns and BPOs or um, if we bring in a new campaign or new staff, I mean, this is quite a complex dynamic we now have to manage. And this is where I think uh, we talk about labor law uh, costing a lot of money to implement, costing operations, slowing business down, red tape. This is really where the, the t uh, tire hits the tarmac, I think, here. Um, and anything that helps make us more nimble is going to have huge cost implications for the business. Um, Michael, just on this, um, I think this is a very performance one. So where you've got the performance related to pay and you categorize all of these things. If you, a lot of uh, businesses are quite fast moving. So things change on the ground within three, four months. So if you've said, okay, these are our categories. This is how we're going to pay. Uh, and this is how we're going to differentiate between people doing the same job on pay. And you then need to change it because think, how, how do you go about that without ending up at CCMA people saying you're moving the goalposts unfairly? No, people know how to performance manage. And if you set targets and you set and you on people weekly, daily even, then you can explain how it would work in that terms of that performance management. I've never had to performance manage anyone, so I don't know. But the CCMA will respect your performance management system before they will respect the individual. And people buy into the system. The people have been properly trained at the CCMA as to how your performance management should be working. And as long as you're implementing it properly, then you can differentiate in the pay. In other words, if I'm selling widgets and you've said that we've got to sell 10 widgets a day, and yet I'm only selling five, and yet they've got another one who's selling 15, obviously the other guy is going to be earning more than me, first of all. And second of all, the first guy you're going to be saying, well, look, if you don't hit the target next week, we're going to bring you into performance management hearing, and we might have to even dismiss you. So I think then you can justify it, but you guys know better than us. Cool. And it's no coincidence that I schedule the performance management as a topic in this because of how important it does relate to this. And 
why it's around that tension between compliance and performance. And obviously for the business, performance has to trump, but we still need to be compliant. So it's a happy coincidence what Michael said around the next presentation. Um, so in terms of temporary employment services, temporary employment service agencies can still supply and uh, provide temporary employment services, but the nature of what that means has adjusted. Um, and there's a lot more uh, risk on both parties, um, and obviously that needs to be factored into it. But basically, Section 198A to D apply to the TES, including the same exemptions where applicable. Um, a key one, though, is that um, the deeming provision um, and judges have spoken, it hasn't been tested, but they've said that in their opinion, this is how it will apply, is that if a uh, temporary employment uh, uh, claim uh, employee brings a claim and they're successful, whether it's around uh, equal treatment or whether it's around um, the three month uh, unfair dismissal, um, then it will be considered dual employment or joint and several liability uh, after the three months. Now. Obviously, that's scary for clients um, because you know you feel like a lack of control, and then you still may be found responsible as an employee employer. So, what's the point of outsourcing? What's the point in using temporary employment services? The way around that is indemnity: is to make sure there's an indemnity clause. So, you may still be found, but the contract between you, the SLA between you and the uh, uh, service provider, means that they are responsible for the cost of that. Um, and in that regard, therefore, it's really important that your SLA with them is watertight. You understand what the, because everyone's promising indemnity clauses, but if they're not watertight uh, or financially they can't deliver on what they promised, you're still going to be responsible. So you need to make sure the SLA is watertight. Um, you understand what an indemnity clause should look like and how it should be managed. And then also you need to ensure that you believe that people have the financial resources to protect you should it ever be called to account. Uh, and then partnership. There's been a lot of talk and use of words of partnership between agencies and employers. It doesn't always live up to that. Uh, partnership is now going to become important for both parties. The risk on the agency is, is ever so much more in terms of what they could end up with. But also, if it goes wrong, it can also be your risk too. So partnership really will matter. And the question is probably, it's a lot like since LinkedIn came in. Um, since LinkedIn came in, I meet a lot of HR managers say, well, I've got LinkedIn. Why would I need a recruitment agency? Um, and in terms of LinkedIn, where you need to know how to use it and actually use it, um, it's not that simple. And it's uh, why use a recruitment agency? Well, the labor law just got more complicated. It just got more onerous. It just got more burdensome. So in terms of labor law, the red tape is real cost to a business. So why would you use one? You would use it because they have expert, dedicated services for managing the increased IR burden and risk. And if you think around all the all the the traps for operations to slow you down, to increase costs, to make you uh, less nimble, clearly there's value in that. But obviously you need to partner with people who actually make that easier for you, not fly by nights who charge you some money and then collapse under the strain. And why not to use TES agencies as importantly, if you're trying to use them and if any of them come and promise this, run a mile, if they say we'll use us and then we will retrench at the end of the three months or we'll fire them, the labor law will still find you responsible. So it will find you jointly responsible if that's how you try and use it. You cannot get around the labor law in that way. And the spirit and intent will be upheld in that regard. Um, so just in terms of some next steps, um, some of you may be ahead of the game, but I've interacted with a lot of big uh, international, multinational companies haven't got this all sorted. So for example, they have multiple sites across South Africa, let alone the rest of Africa and internationally, and they do not know, they don't have all the contracts of their staff from there. They're still trying to get them out of ops managers who aren't cooperating. And they're in remote areas, so it's not as simple as driving there. Uh, they haven't got all the contracts from their agencies. They don't know who's employed on what. They don't know how many staff. And to get this information is a major, major project. And they don't have the resources over and above their normal workload. So they're really struggling with this. So it's really important that you know First of all, that your contract of employment at the different levels below the threshold is still legal. And you will need to make changes. If you've changed nothing from before this law, then you probably have holes in your contract. So get it seen to, whether it's Michael, whether it's your own labor lawyer, but make sure you trust them, make sure they understand the labor law. There are a lot of mixed messages out there and there are some suppliers who don't understand it, but are claiming they do. So really make sure 
you understand, get a second opinion. Uh, check all your contracts of employment for all employees. Make sure they align with the new contract. And then if they don't, you need to go around changing them. IR policies and processes, there are real implications for this. So assess them. Assess whether they're still applicable. If you have changed nothing from before the legal changes, they're not. I guarantee you, you've got holes and you're going to get found out eventually. Um, and then also, just as importantly, because communication is important, change your handbook. It's no good just changing it in the back office and not telling everyone up uh, or your staff. And then also make sure management understand it. A lot of you rely to some degree on some level of IR management through direct line managers. Ops management do not consider the labor law the most interesting, pressing thing in their schedule. They have targets, they have KPIs. So the chances that just because you sent them an email that this is happening, that they've digested it and they're now applying it, it's unlikely. So um, uh, training, uh, assessing it and training is very important. In terms of your, t your suppliers, if you're using suppliers, you must insist, and you have every right to insist, that you get out all your SLAs that you have an SLA, that the SLA is compliant, that you have an indemnity clause. If you don't have it, get it in place. The check their financial resources in that case if you're going to keep using them in case there is a big claim, and try and work out how many staff they have so if they can actually manage that cost. Your procurement process needs to now uh, include this sort of thing, um, and procurement is a very slow-moving beast, so I'm sure some of you need to poke and prod them. Um, and then also, you need to also check that the IR policies, procedures, and practices, especially the practices, are legit and in line not only with the labor law, but aligned to what you do. Um, because if your agency is found to be committing unfair practices on staff that you're using, again, dual responsibility. Um, and if they are uh, committing unfair practices, it's unlikely they're going to hold up their end of the indemnity product if they're not doing things legit in the first place. And then um, temp employee contracts, you should ask to see every single temp employee's contract to make sure you're happy with them. It's a bit more work, but you still obviously aren't having to do the day-to-day -day aspect. And partnership, it's not only about you managing the TES, it's about the TES managing you. They should be the experts. They're going to carry risk. So for example, if they're taking people on permanently for a campaign you have, the financial risk for them is very great. If they put an indemnity clause in and you go fire their person without speaking to them, it's not due process. They're the ones who potentially could end up with the cost. So they need to learn to manage you and help you also. But by that partnership, hopefully it helps you uh, put things in place your side. So in terms of what status can help, we help with um, obviously IR processes and CCMA representation that's uh, supported and backed up by Bagrams. A hotline phone number to Michael Bagrams around IR queries uh, for those late night IR emergencies, if you have those. Um, consultation on auditing your current IR process and a strategy and planning roadmap plan for navigating your way forward and a project management plan for that. And then full IR training for your HR team and ops manager, which I think if you don't want to lose at CCMA, that's probably the most important one. Because if you do all this stuff in your paperwork, if it's not being applied, it's a nightmare. So if you want to chat, I don't want to push more around that. But if you want to chat to us, please ask. We're happy to come through and meet with you one on one, both ourselves and Michael. In terms of atypical employment solutions, there was a lot of talk around what may or may not be applicable. But right now, until the case law plays out, and it becomes clearer, and then I think there will be a lot more creativity around TES and how it's applied. Basically, learnerships, uh, clearly a justifiable reason, limited and definite uh, length with limited sources of funding, and then also outsourcing. And I think an unintended consequence that o over the medium term of this labor law, which isn't what the unions were attending, is there's going to be a lot of outsourcing of non-core functions. And you'll get uh, businesses like cleaners where they do cleaning for lots of companies. It's their staff. It's not an essential. But I think cleaning is a very superficial one. I think there's going to be things like, I don't know, QA for a call center. Um, it might be HR outsourced altogether. But there'll be areas where businesses start to splice and dice their workload, both core and non-core functions, and work out what they can outsource and what can be projects, even though it's ongoing work, but it can be defined into a project and then you uh, contract accordingly. So I think project managers are going to become a very, very massive resource in the coming years because of the value they'll offer. But if you want to chat more about this, get in touch with us.